Hello everyone, I'm here in a very special edition of Through Conversations podcast. Joining me today is Professor Noam Chomsky for a second time. Last time was a year ago almost, and we weren't expecting to have this conversation in, in such a turnaround of events whole, around the whole world. And I'm very glad to have you with me again. It's, it's a tremendous honor. Some members of, uh, some listeners of the podcast regarded our conversation as one of the best and I hope we do justice to yourself and we I hope we we get it to the truth point of things so thank you for joining me professor pleased to be with you again yes I'm very glad and you know the I would like to discuss uh, a lot of things with you and I know we're we're short on time time is sometimes our enemy and We've seen how the world has shaped now in terms of the Ukraine-Russia crisis, the conflict, the war. And I've seen some of the things you've been mentioning about how to reach a peaceful ending to this, hopefully. And you argue that in order to end this conflict, the two nations must agree on a settlement. And I'm curious to to know how do you see this unfolding and how would that settlement look like for the whole international affairs? It's uh, been well understood for some time what the terms of a general settlement are. Uh, unfortunately, uh, two major powers who might help implement it uh, are refusing to one is China, which is properly criticized for its unwillingness to engage in negotiations. Uh, the other, more significant, much more significantly, is the United States, uh, which is exempt from critical analysis within our highly indoctrinated culture. Uh, but uh, there are uh, highly respected uh, analysts, some of the most respected, who do talk about it. Uh, one doesn't hear much of them, but they're there. Uh, one of the most important is uh, Ambassador Charles Freeman, one of the most respected members of the diplomatic service, uh, uh, deeply involved in these issues since the 1990s, when he was one of those who was working on the partnership for peace intended to accommodate Russia in a peaceful system. This was undermined by Bill Clinton when he, mostly for domestic reasons, domestic politics, uh, decided to break the firm commitment of the United States and Germany and NATO explicitly not to extend NATO powers to the east, east of Germany. Well, uh, his position, clear, I think correct, is that the US is refusing to engage in what he calls diplomacy and statecraft, and worse is setting up conditions which make these harder to achieve. Uh, uh, that's not a discussion that's allowed in the United States. We're supposed to keep to uh, trying to figure out what's in Putin's twisted mind and so on, uh, which we don't know. There's one way to find out whether Russia would agree to a settlement in these terms, to try. There's no other way. Uh, President Zelensky has put forward basically these terms. I could go into the details, but essentially the terms that have long been understood, they require neutralization of Ukraine, meaning that Ukraine should have a status rather like Mexico or Austria. Uh, no infringement on sovereignty, but they can't engage in uh, military exercises with hostile powers can't emplace weapons uh, aiming at the United States or Russia. All of this is 
simply understood in the case of Ukraine, in the case of Mexico, by treaty in the case of Austria, uh, Zelensky has made the same proposal for Ukraine. Uh, the Russians have at least claimed that that's what they're aiming for. You can find out by trying. There are other issues and could go into them, but that's the major one. So could it be done? If it could, it could save the lives of Ukrainians. Uh, otherwise, we consider it our priority to punish Russia, no matter how Ukraine, many Ukrainians are killed. As Ambassador Freeman puts it, to fight Russia to the last Ukrainian. That's the other possibility, the one we're in fact pursuing. Some of the proposals are, I must say, pretty amazing. So take a look at this morning's New York Times. Uh, there's an important contribution by a distinguished liberal voice, uh, Professor, Professor Emeritus Lawrence Tribe, Harvard Law School. Uh, his suggestion to deal with the crisis is to step up the punishment of Ukraine. I'm virtually quoting now, though it's hard to believe these words, to punish Ukraine, to punish Russia, by following the precedent that George W. Bush used when he punished Iraq in 2003 by withholding their funds. Bush published, punished Iraq in 2003. It's hard to repeat these words. Did Bush do something else to Iraq to protect it in 2003? Well, if you mention that, that's what's called whataboutism, one of the devices used to prevent any departure from the party line. But if we can manage that, uh, we might recall that something else happened in, uh, uh, in 2003. Well, not mentioned. Uh, Tribe does go on to say that uh, sometimes there are problems about takings, basically robbing the money that's placed in US banks uh, for security, as Bush did when he was punishing Iraq in 2003. The president tribe says we should follow. He says sometimes it's problematic. And he mentions the case of Afghanistan, where he said Putin's withholding funds from the government of Afghanistan is controversial his word, and he explains why. He says it's controversial because there are unsettled problems about distributing Afghanistan's funds to victims of 9-11 in the United States. Uh, what about the fact that a uh, couple of million Afghanistans are facing starvation, that uh, mothers have to watch their children starve because they can't access their bank accounts to get food from the market. Well, that's evidently not controversial because that's not mentioned. And in fact, if you go on, take the New York Times, major liberal journal, you find grounds presented for these positions. So their leading thinker, their main foreign policy specialist, Thomas Friedman, uh, had an op-ed a couple of days ago in which he described their incredible dilemma. The headline was something like, how can we deal with war criminals? Mm -hmm. How can we deal with war criminals? Can you think of any? Mm -hmm. Well, only if you commit the sin of what's about ism and look at the actual world hardly a surprise that the civilized part of the world, which is mostly the global south, is just watching this with amazement. What's going on in this insane country, which incidentally has Europe in its lap at the present, even crazier in some ways. Yes, no, but it's, you know, it's, it's the first time I've ever witnessed a war, a full out war in my life. 
and it's hard to discern between truth and noise it's hard to you know rationalize that a war is happening and we can see it real time in social media everyone commenting on it everyone speaking about it and actually just talking about it we 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 don't know what to do and personally speaking i believe that uh, if you wanted to say something go ahead first of all i think we do know what to do uh, a war uh, let me first make a side comment this war is horrible enough but it's nothing like a major war uh, the number of it there hideous atrocities Uh, the death toll is in the thousands. It's not like the U.S. invasion of Iraq. It's not like the destruction of Indochina. Those are major wars. Mm. This might turn into a major war if you drive Putin and his clique, if you drive their back to the wall. They might, in fact, do what they could do. They might turn to the kinds of tactics that the U.S. uses, like saturation, bombing of heavily populated uh, areas, uh, chemical warfare. There are no concerns about unconfirmed reports that Russia might use chemical warfare. The Secretary General of, you know, the, of NATO said if they do, all options are open, nuclear war, anything else. Notice if we, again, agree to the, accept the sin of whataboutism, there are victims of chemical war dying right now. Are we doing anything about it? Are we doing anything about the deformed fetuses in Saigon hospitals right now? Part of the result of the major uh, employment of chemical war starting in the Kennedy administration, which has had a devastating and lasting effect on uh, South, South Vietnam. North Vietnam wasn't exposed to this particular horror. Uh, are we doing anything about it? No. no. A lot of people say they're terribly upset about abortion. Do they care about deformed fetuses appearing in Saigon hospitals. Well, apparently that's not controversial either, just like millions of Afghans starving. Uh, well, that's what about is. What can we do? Do we know what to do? Yes. What we know to do is to try to end the war. Wars can end in one of two ways, either by one side destroying the other or by negotiations. We prefer the first part. And you can be confident that it's not Russia that's going to be destroyed. Ukraine conceivably, unlikely, but conceivably could drive Russia out of Ukraine, but they're not going to destroy Russia. Mm -hmm. Russia can easily destroy Ukraine. And if you believe what respected Western commentators are saying, and Applebaum's and others, you can read them in the Atlantic Council and elsewhere. They're saying Russia is so crazy they could do anything. So therefore, we have to refuse negotiations and ensure that Russia de destroys U Ukraine. That's the logic. Hmm. Okay. Kind of interesting. And this is respected. Let's fight Russia to the last Ukrainian as Ambassador Freeman describes their policy. Well, maybe it'll come to that, but there's a way out, negotiations. And as long as we refuse to participate in them, they're unlikely to get anywhere. And we might recall something else that Ambassador Freeman and others point out. The U.S. is not just refusing negotiations, it's undermining them. The press won't report it, yeah. but you can be sure that Russian intelligence looks at the uh, White House webpage and sees what's there. 
for example, they see our official policy of last September and last November. I've written about it, press won't report it, but the Russians certainly read it. And what they read is that the US is setting up an enhanced program for Ukraine to join NATO, is providing advanced military weapons. This is before the invasion, providing an advanced military weapons to Ukraine, uh, joint military operations, uh, a training of uh, Ukrainian uh, specialists in advanced weapons aimed at Russia. I simply imagine for a moment that this was happening in Mexico. What do you think the response would be? <laughs> well, Mexico would be vaporized, okay? Yeah. Because we have uh, security problems, but the Russians don't, you know? Yeah. Wow. It's, it's, a lot to take in and you know what i what i really try to say is that there's so much noise around around the conflict and there's so many perspectives and and narratives going on that at least for me it's difficult to discern between truth and noise so i wanted to ask you professor how do you usually tackle these big issues how do you research or do some uh Difference, the differentiation between well, you use what evidence is available. So let's take Ukraine again. Prior to the invasion, uh, there are OSCE observers, European uh, observers on the ground, especially in the Donbas area. Uh, they've been providing daily reports on what's happening for years. According to their reports, uh, there's ex uh, escalating, has been esca before the invasion, escalating violence in the Donbas area. Uh, they estimate maybe 15,000 dead, uh, overwhelmingly in the border areas. Uh, they don't attribute the uh, attacks, but uh, it's not unreasonable to assume that it's mainly due to the large increase in Ukrainian military forces at the border. Now, how do you assess this? Well, one way to assess it would be to uh, pursue the OSCE observers and to see if they're willing to, uh, that's, part, that's not part of their mandate to determine who's doing the bombing. They just report that it's taking place. Well, they could look further, um, and it's not impossible. I think it's rather likely that if they do, they'll confirm the Russian reports that most of these, that the vast increase in military action is coming from the US-backed Ukrainian side. I can't say that because all we have is surmises, but let's investigate. Doesn't sound impossible. I don't know anyone who's doing it, but it could be done. Yeah. Yes, Professor. And another another question I had uh, is, you know, after the dust settles and for a moment we see a truce or, you know, the the future five years from now, 10 years from now, how does the international chess board looks for you? How does the diplomatic affairs between the Western world and the Eastern world look like and, you know, how does how does this all play out in the long term? I know you, you also mentioned how this has affected our fight against climate change, and I'd love to get to that as well. Well, I think if you want a good answer to this question, one of the first places to look is at the executive offices of Lockheed Martin, Exxon Mobil, other major arms and, and fossil fuel producers. What you see when you look there is total euphoria. They've never seen anything so marvelous. Huge increases in military budgets, 
not only in the United States, but in Europe. US is, of course, the major arms exporter. So it's terrific prospects. And it's interesting to look at the reason. I'll come to the others in a moment, but let's look at the reasoning. According to the Western consensus, the Russians have proven themselves to be a paper tiger. The military is so incompetent that it was unable to conquer cities 30 kilometers from its border. And they suffered a military debacle and they're now pulling back to the Donbass region close to their border. That's the near universal consensus. Conclusion, Western Europe and the United States have to arm themselves to the teeth to defend themselves against this incredible military force, which is just about to swallow up uh, Europe and the United States, namely the military force that can't conquer cities 30 kilometers from its border that are not defended by a modern army. That's the reasoning. So naturally it leads to euphoria at Lockheed Martin headquarters. Maybe you're smart enough to figure out the logic. It kind of escapes me. But uh, now let's go to ExxonMobil. They're besides themselves. First of all, they have these annoying environmentalists out of their hair. Nobody bothers them. In fact, they're being praised for increasing uh, oil, uh, petroleum production. They're being lauded for the huge increase in their already loaded profits and for going on to lay the basis for the destruction of human life on earth. They're being lauded for it. As they put it, they want to be hugged for saving civilization by acting to destroy the prospects for its survival. Well, again, maybe you can figure out the logic. I have a little problem with it. I mean, I can understand the euphoria. I mean, profits are just going through the, the roof and they're no longer under any criticism. But what about the rest of us watching this spectacle? It's kind of interesting. You can understand why the global south, the more civilized part of the world, is looking at all of this with just disbelief. Mm -hmm. What's going on in the heads of these lunatics? Yes. No, it's 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 overwhelming, overwhelming to say the least. And you know, if if I could ask you the likelihood of this escalating to our words, another world war, would you say it is likely or no? It's very hard to say what the likelihood is. It's been hard for 75 years. If you look at the record, the military, the nuclear record, it's a miracle that we've survived, literally. Yes. I mean, there have been thousands of cases of accidents not planned, which could easily have led to debacle. There's been case after case where human intervention at the last minute staved off total disaster. It's just an astonishing record. There are also cases of very reckless acts by leaders daring the fates, saying maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't, but we're going to go ahead. Uh, that's not going to decline. We're in one of those moments now when the Secretary General Stoltenberg of uh, NATO says all options are on the table, we know where we are. We're in a case where somebody who's supposed to have a functioning brain and to know something about uh, nuclear weapons is saying one of the possibilities is that we'll decide to destroy the world. Hmm. That's what he's saying. He's saying if it turns out that Russia is planning to use chemical weapons, then everything changes and all options are open. 
all options include nuclear options. Nuclear options means we all get destroyed. But that's one of the options that's open in case these unconfirmed reports turn out to be true. We, of course, dismiss the confirmed reports, like those that I mentioned, that has the uh, problem of wrong agent, so we don't talk about it. And this puts into perspective, at least for me, what we're witnessing. It won't be like any war in history. If there's a nuclear war among major powers, the power that initiates the war will be destroyed, almost certainly, simply by the effects of nuclear winter. Yeah. Even if there's no retaliatory strike. If there is a retaliatory strike, it's beyond discussion. Yeah. Professor, and having all of this in mind, you know, the, the macro side of things, the macro world, geographic tensions, international affairs, going southbound, how would you recommend, you know, the individuals to, you know, self-reliance, to create, foster self-reliance and, you know, pass through the storm and be able to, you know, don't become overwhelmed and create actual change? How can we, how can we do that? Well, each of us can ask the most serious question that we can possibly ask ourselves. What can I do to mitigate the threats, help improve the world? And there's a lot of things that each of us can do. I mean, we can't uh, change policy in Russia. I have no way to do that. I have no way to affect policy in China. We can affect policy in the United States. It's not a totalitarian state. Uh, you, you and I are not going to be sent to the gulag for having this discussion. We'll be ignored. That's the way it's handled in the United States. You ignore it. So you don't publish uh, official U.S. policy. Uh, you leave that to the Kremlin to read, not Americans. But you don't uh, uh, punish those who talk about it. Well, that means we can. We can organize. We can act. It's often succeeded in the past. Uh, let's take real cases. Uh, in the early 1980s, there was a serious buildup of tensions that might have led to nuclear war. There was a huge popular up, uh, uprising in Europe and the United States, maybe the largest in history. Enormous mobilization against Reagan's escalation of the war had an effect. In 1987, uh, Reagan and Gorbachev reached a very important treaty, the INF Treaty, which restricted the use of, uh, eliminated, in fact, all short-range missiles in uh, Europe and Russia. That was very important. It sharply reduced the threat of war and uh, 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 improved the situation enormously until 2018, when President Trump, in his commitment to destroy everything in sight, uh, also destroyed, uh, ended the INF Treaty, the Reagan-Gorbachev Treaty. And to show that he really meant it, tell the Russians, I mean this, uh, he immediately immediately within days, launched uh, missiles that violated the treaty. Obviously, they'd been prepared and set up to. So this is telling the Russians, take it or leave it. We're placing you under great military threat. Well, the Russians didn't say thank you. Uh, they responded by, as you'd expect. So we've escalated that threat. Well, in the early 1980s, popular mobilization sufficed to end it. 
it can again. You don't have to sit here and watch this happen. And the same is true on the climate front. I mean, in the United States, in Congress, there is a resolution introduced by Alexander, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, young representative who came in on the Sanders wave, and Ed Markey, senior senator from Massachusetts, been involved in environmental issues for many years. Now, their resolution is a detailed, feasible proposal as to how to reach the announced goals, which would in fact uh, allow for a livable earth. Well, it's a resolution, not legislation. Mm -hmm. Here's where people come in. It's gonna stay a resolution and not become legislation unless there are major popular forces that break through the congressional impasse. Now, of course, the Republican Party is 100% opposed. They're in the pocket of the fossil fuel industries. They don't care what happens uh, to the world or anyone else. That's, that too can be changed. It's not permanent. You go back, uh, say, to 2008, which is not ancient history. John McCain, climate plank in his program. Not great, but it was at least something. The Congress, Republican Congress, was beginning to consider some kinds of actions. Well, what happened? The Koch brothers, energy conglomerate, which had been working for years to try to keep the Republican Party in line as a denialist party, went into action with a huge juggernaut, a massive lobbying, a warning Republicans they'd run right-wing primary candidates against them, bribery, uh, astroturfing, Republicans, 100% collapsed. That's the level of integrity in the party. Since then, 100% denialist. But 2008 is an ancient history. Something can be done about that, and also about the Democrats. There are a handful of Democrats, Joe Manchin is the most famous, who are insisting that we race to disaster. He happens to be a major, a coal baron himself, uh, and the leading recipient of funding from fossil fuel industries and in current Congress. Uh, he happens to be acting in opposition to his own constituency. The mine workers in West Virginia, his state, the mine workers, United Mine Workers, have accepted, in principle, a transition program which would support them as they deserve to be supported as they make the move from coal mining to working in uh, uh, sus sustainable energy, uh, other forms of occupation, mm -hmm. easily feasible, not much cost. And they've accepted that, but not their representative who is joining 100% of Republicans in blocking even the most minimal the climate programs, let alone the really serious one, which would probably not be accepted by the mainstream Democrats, the Clinton, uh, Clintonite, Wall Street oriented general, uh, Democrats probably wouldn't accept it either. But that can be changed from the grassroots, the way everything has happened. I mentioned the uh, mobilization on uh, nuclear war, but same is true of civil rights, uh, women's rights, uh, war in Vietnam, you, you name it. It's popular mobilization can make a difference, particularly in basically free countries like the United States, where there can be plenty of violence and repression, but it's not like a totalitarian state. Yes. Yeah, thank you for, for your answer, Professor. And, you know, there's a lot of 
to think about you know we have the social media platforms now that i don't know if you in your perspective get us closer to mobilization or further because there are so many so many points of view clashing in the marketplace do you think social media helps us in this movement social media could help and to some extent they do there are outlets internet sites and others where all of these things are discussed unfortunately a large part of social media is just engaged in small-scale squabbles uh did this guy say a word wrong or say it right or yeah. or else just in driving people into closed bubbles where they hear nothing but reinforcing their own views and don't begin to engage in the these general issues and by cutting off access you lose a lot just give you an example uh i haven't looked at everything obviously but i have been looking pretty carefully to see if any media published media will be willing to publish official us policy on ukraine the policy that is making it impossible for negotiations to go forward i found one journal the american conservative a right wing journal cato institute they have published a couple of articles which in fact describe what i've just been saying as you can imagine i don't agree with them on a lot of things but i have to give them credit for being willing to do what as far as i know all the liberal media have refused to do well if you lock yourself in a bubble you're not going to find this mm -hmm. it's not the only case time mm -hmm. time flew by professor i just to wrap up one more question it's a yeah. personal one i i've been meaning to ask you this what piece of advice you remember until today that has made the most impact in your life not advice events like uh, there are events which i remember very well and had a big impact on my life uh, one of them i'm pretty old as you can see one of them is in 1939 when i wrote the first article that i can remember for an elementary school newspaper it was about it's easy to time because of the event it was about the fall of barcelona which meant franco's victory in spain the victory of fascism in spain and the article which i'm sure is nothing to remember was about uh, the apparently inexorable spread of fascism over europe a dark cloud that looked as if it was going to overwhelm the world uh, czechoslovakia austria now spain where is it going to stop that's one thing i remember very well go on a couple of years 1945 august 6th i remember that very well that was the moment when we learned if we wanted to learn that human intelligence had achieved the level where it would soon be capable of destroying everything and i learned two lessons on that day one was what had just happened the second was nobody cared i happened to be at a summer camp junior counselor summer camp the news of the hiroshima bombing was announced in the morning over the camp loudspeaker people listened everybody went on to their morning activity swimming baseball game uh, whatever it is nobody cared when i got back to the city i saw also who cares well those are two lessons that are hard to forget and they apply today just about what we've been talking about is there something we can do about it plenty but not if we just sit back yes yes professor and i i really want to say how much 
your your words do make an impact in in our perspective in my perspective and our listeners and i can't tell you how grateful i am for you to be speaking on these issues your wisdom really makes me and makes others reflect on what can we do about it and actively change things so words don't suffice me thank you so much for joining me and i'm very glad that you're here and we'll stay in touch very pleased to know what you're doing makes a big difference thank you professor oh.